Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, for, from wherever you are joining us today. Uh, my name is Thomas Tinnefeld. I'm a professor of applied languages and a board member of the ICC, the Language Association. I'm very happy to be here today as your moderator or co-moderator for this webinar for the celebration of the European Day of Languages. The European Day of Languages was launched by the Council of Europe in 2001. Every year on September the 26th, the wealth of languages in Europe and beyond is celebrated. This is a day to raise awareness of the significance of languages, to promote rich linguistic and cultural diversity of Europe, and to encourage lifelong language learning. Today's webinar is organized in the spirit of celebrating linguistic diversity and in observance of the European Day of Languages. We will therefore be exploring the features and the impact of Duolingo, a language learning platform with over 500 million registered users. And in all modesty, I might say I'm one of them. Joining me is my colleague, Mr. Barry Tomlin, who is also a board member of the ICC. And together we're excited to guide you through today's event. My special thanks go to Dr. Cindy Blanco, who is deputy editor of Learning Content at Duolingo, who recommended our today's guest speaker, Mr. Parker Henry, for this webinar to me. We also want to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you, which I tried to do, or Barry and I tried to do a little bit beforehand. Thank you for joining us as we are coming together to celebrate the European Day of Languages. This day is a testament to the richness of our diverse cultures and to the power of communication across borders. So today's webinar is a unique blend of celebrating multilingualism and linguistic diversity, as well as featuring cutting edge technology, which Duolingo is. We are privileged to have this remarkable partner with us, Duolingo, a pioneer in language learning. With so many million users, 500 million, I told you beforehand, Duolingo's journey into gener generative AI and immersive features remarkably underline their commitment to making language learning accessible, engaging, and last but not least, perhaps most importantly, free. Moreover, we acknowledge the broader theme of AI, a topic that has gained immense prominence since the launch of innovative technologies like ChatGPT to the general public in November last year. The role of artificial intelligence in language learning and its impact on our educational landscape represents a fascinating topic which we will explore further today. In the next hour, we'll investigate the synergy between this special day, the mission of Duolingo, the transformative power of generative AI, and the immersive features that enhance language learning. To guide us through this enlightening discussion, I now pass the microphone over to my colleague, Barry, who will introduce our today's webinar speaker, Mr. Parker Henry. Barry, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you, Thomas. I have, uh, first of all, to say um, welcome to everybody, uh, both to uh, um, personal friends who are online and also to um, colleagues from around the world. Um, Duolingo basically operates in 40 languages at the moment. I'm sure Parker will up, up um, um, say, oh, no, no, it's gone up a lot by that. As Thomas said, it's looking at learning languages and um, also, I noticed, to my astonishment, that it does a heck of a lot more than I ever thought they did. In other words, they're teaching learning to read and write. Um, there's a Duolingo mathematics program. I couldn't believe that. I could have used that myself. And, um, and obviously, uh, uh, online learning is the key, as Thomas described it. And also, they look at business language, which is, again, very important to people like Evan Prendo and Kirsten and myself and Francis. And also alphabet, how to read, um, how to uh, reading skills, a very, very important development, especially for people working in uh, tertiary higher education. So really, it is a, it's a one size fits all program. It's really, really very cleverly done. And I can't wait, Parker, to hear you tell us more about how it works and how it operates. So without any more ado, let me turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Um, 
It is a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, thank you for uh, the warm introduction. My name is Parker Henry, as said. I am a learning designer at Duolingo and a recently turned prompt engineer as the company has moved more into generative AI. And I'm excited today to talk about how Duolingo has historically been using artificial intelligence and how we've pivoted some of our content strategies to incorporate generative AI currently. So just a quick overview of Duolingo for those who may not know what we are. We are the world's most downloaded education app and we take great pride that we are the number one education app on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. We have over 500 million learner accounts around the globe, and over 21 million people are what we call daily active users, meaning that they are using the program daily to create a language learning habit. We have over 100 courses teaching about 40 languages, so our numbers are accurate. Each of these courses is also directional. So the English course for German speakers is different than the English course for French speakers, which is different than the English course for Spanish speakers. And these are all made with the home language in mind and uh, our learning designers are constantly thinking about what concepts might be difficult when transferring between any two languages. And our mission is to develop the best education in the world and to make it universally available. And this stems from our CEO, Luis Van Aan, who grew up in Guatemala um, and who saw the really positive effects that a good education can have. But I think unlike a lot of uh, maybe Fairy tale scenarios, he doesn't see education as the great equalizer. He sees those with lots of resources and money being able to purchase high quality education and to remain on top. So Luis wants to be a disruptor in the field of education to make these skills uh, universally available. He often cites that in Guatemala, your earning income potential can double if you are proficient in English, which is why we're very committed to making learning content on the app free and never to put a paywall in front of uh, content that someone might be able to learn. Instead, we, uh, we have a version that users can use to pay for features rather than content. And just to show kind of our reach and our um, contemporariness, uh, in March of 2022, over 1.3 million people flocked to our Ukrainian course, um, which just kind of shows how much uh, we can be useful based on current events and the zeitgeist of the time. So an overview of this presentation, I'm going to talk about three main things. Um, mostly, I'll start with the historic use of AI Duolingo. This is not a space that we are new in, um, and we've had AI initiatives for several years now. This is not something that I work directly on, but it's something that gives good context into Duolingo's foray into AI. I'll then give uh, an overview of how we are moving into generative AI within the last year or so. And there are really two main ways we're moving into generative AI. Uh, mostly we are using it to create learning content dynamically at scale and in bulk. So I'll talk about how we create a lot of the questions that you would see in the app using generative AI. And then I'll talk about our Duolingo Max subscription, which is a higher subscription tier that uses AI to uh, simulate immersion in role play and that allows users to have on-call tips and answer explanations with Max Coach. So in essence, under the generative AI umbrella, we have generating content, we have simulating immersion through role play, and we have giving tips and explanations through Max Coach. And then at the end, I'll go over some of the future iterations we can see with generative AI and some of our ideas for the future. So to begin, I'll talk about Duolingo's historic use of AI. So like I said, this isn't something that I work directly on. We have a lot of machine learning engineers whose specialty is this, but we've been using a machine learning model for a long time to personalize our learning sessions for our users. So Duolingo is not a one size fits all course. It is adapting to your performance to make sure you're getting what you need. And this machine learning model is called BirdBrain, which is kind of a play off of our mascot, which is an owl. So BirdBrain is constantly looking at the exercises you're completing for any given learner. It's looking at their progress and their performance. And with this information, it's taking in a huge amount of data and it's predicting what exercise should come next based on your ability level that will be in your zone of proximal development. So not too hard and not too easy. So you can see 
Lily is on the left here. She's using her Duolingo app and some questions she's consistently getting correct, some types of questions she's consistently getting wrong, and some types of questions she'll get wrong on the first try maybe, and then right on the next try. And we're keeping track of all of that. And the data we're keeping track of is what words Lily tends to have trouble with what grammatical concepts Lily consistently misses, and what skills Lily is growing in, so speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And based on all that information, every user gets a unique user state, which predicts which exercises we'll give to them next. So you might have two learners that are at two different points on their language learning journey. Eddie on the top might be pretty strong in reading, but needs more support in listening based on his performance. So being able to track Eddie's data will allow us to surface more listening exercises for him because that is his weaker spot. And it's not just skills like speaking, listening, reading, and writing that we're tracking. We're also looking at grammatical concepts, like I said, and word familiarity. So Vikram at the bottom seems to have mastered plurals and has more trouble with pronouns. So we're going to surface more exercises that have to do with pronouns for Vikram. And it's not just the frequency of these types of exercises, it's also the difficulty level within a given exercise. So for example, Eddie has good reading, knowledges, reading knowledge. His reading questions will tend to be more difficult than his listening questions. This is to push him, uh, even though he's reached a high level in this, this is to push him to complete harder exercises. Similarly with Vikram, his exercises with plurals probably will not be just tokens that you tap. He'll probably have to type them in himself because we want that exercise to be challenging in areas that he has high proficiency in. So that's why when you are doing a Duolingo lesson, you often will see uh, the very last question will contain Duo. He'll say, great work, now here's a hard exercise. And this badge here, is indicating that the exercise will be in your zone of proximal development, or it will be catered to your specific abilities. So we're using AI in that way to collect a lot of data, to create a user profile, and to give you exercises that are suitable for you. And that has been the historic use of AI at Duolingo for the last several years. Recently, though, we've started using generative AI, which is a little bit different than a machine learning model. So generative AI, we're mostly using with text. You can also use generative AI for images or for videos or for sounds, but we're mostly using it for text. And we've learned a lot about it as we've begun and continued to work with it. So in the simplest terms possible, generative AI is choosing the next most probable word in a string of text. Now, I have a string of text here. It's a partial sentence. It's quite short and simple. So if my input here is short and simple, my output probably will not be super nuanced. And you can think, I really like French. An infinite number of words could come after this, uh, this partial sentence. Each one of those infinite number of possible words has like a percentage probable attached to it. So some words, are very highly probable to come after this sentence. So for example, I really like French fries. This is a very high likelihood. I really like French movies. This also is a very possible sentence. So these two words would have high probability marked by them. There are other words that, sure, they're possible to come next, but they're very, very unlikely. So grammatically, I really like French movies makes a lot more sense than I really like French movie. Um, and then lexically, the doesn't really make sense coming next in this sequence. And then finally, there are some words that, though possible, are almost, impo uh, almost improbable, almost a 0% chance to come next. So with a simple input like this, I get a less nuanced output. But if I add a more complex input, it steers the AI model more towards some words than others. So for example, if I said in my input, I really like burgers and I really like French the probability of fries is going to go up like exponentially based on that context. It's almost definitely going to be fries. Or if I say like, I like all movies, but I really like French, then the probability of movies is going to go way, way up. So based on how complex our input is, the more nuanced and targeted our output is. And so we're using these to do a lot of interesting feature improvements at Duolingo. 
Um, we've been working with generative AI for about a year and a half now, and we've come to get some learnings. Um, we know that generative AI is really good at some stuff. It's a very popular topic in pop culture and the news now, so I'm sure a lot of you have played with ChatGPT or you've seen some of the outputs that it can produce. And the first time you see it, it's often really amazing and exciting and almost shocking at how, uh, how much it's able to produce something. Um, however, we've learned that it's good at some things and not so good at others. So one thing that it's great at is manipulating existing texts. You can put a text in and you can put almost a filter on it or give it some sort of injected voice. And it's very easy to uh, see generative AI change and manipulate that text. Does anyone have a guess as to what this text is? What the original was? You can place it in the chat. It, it was looks the best like... of times. It was the worst of times. Excellent, in yes. <laughs> in, a, in the register of the youth of today. <laughs> that is actually, I'm so impressed how accurate that is. Yes, this is the opening of the Tale of Two Cities. And I said that I wanted it to write it in Gen Z slang. And it did a great job. Um, so it's, it's great at doing this kind of things. If you give it something to anchor on, it'll, it'll adapt it really, really well. It's also great at formatting. If you tell it to write something in a specific format, it follows it fairly well. I asked it to make this format uh, from scratch and it's able to like create this uh, chessboard. We're able to leverage that quite a lot in our generations. We, we really try to steer it toward a particular format and based on that format, it integrates better with our tools and we get a more targeted output. So it's great at formatting. And then another thing is it's good at following simple rules. If I give it three rules that don't really intersect with each other, that all are kind of independent, it will give me a result that really follows those rules fairly well. So each of these three rules don't really affect each other too much. I asked it for dog names. The dog name must be silly. The dog name must include a title, which it does, and the dog name must have a pun, an alliteration, a dog-related play on words. And we get a very accurate uh, output from that. It follows all my rules because they're simple and they can kind of exist alone. Now, we have been playing with AI for a long time and we've learned a little bit about what it's bad at. One thing that I was like pulling my hair out over maybe a year ago is randomness. It is not good at being random. It's good at pretending to be random though. So for example, if I ask it to choose a random number between one and five, it does three. That's a totally acceptable answer. I think uh, the generative AI says like, I know based on my you know, knowledge or scrubbing of the internet that three is an acceptable answer. So I'll give three. And then I ask it again and it gives me three. And then I ask it again and it gives me three. And every single time I ask it, it will always give me three because it knows that's an acceptable answer. But is that truly random if every single time I get three? Not so much. So it's good at um, formatting an answer that seems to fit the problem at hand, but it's not necessarily good at actually being random. Another thing is it's, it's not very good at following complex rules that all kind of intersects or have to do with each other. It tends to choose the path of least resistance, so it'll always give a, an output. It might follow your rules too literally. It might skip some rules in favor of others. So we've had to come up with a lot of tactics and strategies, and um, we've had to write down a lot of learnings for how to get it to follow really complex rules. Here I asked it to write me a joke. I have three rules, just like in the previous slide, but these rules kind of intersect with each other. They're a little bit more complex. And my answer is something. Generative AI will always give you something, but it's not necessarily what I was looking for. Um, and I don't think it's very funny. Um, it tried its best to follow those rules though. The last thing that generative AI is not very good at is math. Um, you know, we think of generative AI as a computer. Computers are great at math. You can code for randomness, you can code for algebra, you can code for arithmetic really accurately. But we have to remember that this is a language model. It's not a mathematic computer. So I gave this long, um, long expression and I asked it to solve for x. I guess I should have added equals zero. The answer is uh, five and three. So it's, it's just wrong. It answers very confidently though. Um, but it knows that this is the format that's often accepted for problems like this. It doesn't necessarily know what the answer is. Now, there are workarounds to this. We found a lot of strategies to um, 
try to get it to explain its reasoning, to spell things out. We kind of create guardrails for it so that when it flows downstream and hits close to where we want it to be. But these are definitely problems that we found while working with generative AI. So that's generative AI in a nutshell. And so we can imagine it as like a really good predictor of next words. And we want to use it to write learning content for us. So if you've used Duolingo, you've seen when you click on a lesson, you get lots and lots of questions. Every single one of those questions that you see was written by a human. It was edited by a human. It was approved by a human. It was translated by a human. It was uploaded by a human. We have people at every step of the process to make sure that the learning content in the app is of high quality and that it teaches well. But now we're starting to use generative AI to do a lot of the writing piece. So when I joined Duolingo, I was working on these exercises. These are six very special exercises. I only had room to paste in five images, but there are six special exercises in Duolingo that are called monolingual exercises. And the value of these exercises is that the question and the answer is in the target language. So all of these are teaching English. My question and my text is in English and my answer options are in English. Similarly, everything here is in English, and I am uh, really engaging with my target language while I'm answering these questions. We think that these questions teach well. They simulate immersion as best as we can because it's a lot of interaction with the target language, but they are very difficult to write. They take a long time. Each one of these questions has a huge set of rules for what it needs to accomplish to be a successful item. And it takes writers a very long time to write them. They then have to be edited. They then have to be you know, proofread. They have to be translated. There is a lot of work that goes into these. So when I started, I was working on developing these uh, six question types for the English course for Spanish speakers, for Portuguese speakers, and for Japanese speakers. And so I became very familiar with these language uh, learning question types. And now we're able to prompt for them. We're able to use generative AI to try to get the AI model to write them instead of people. And it takes someone who has a very intimate knowledge of what these questions are supposed to do to write the prompt. So prompt engineering is basically how we write the rules or the instructions for the generative AI to create these exercises that we're looking for. So you can see this is an example of prompt engineering. This is not an actual prompt that we're using. This is just for demonstration purposes. But it's we're using five basic strategies to try to get the model to output what we want. The first is we're using variables. You see these green texts? You could almost think of them as like blanks. If you've ever done like a Mad Lib story where there are blanks in the story that you can fill in with everything, that's the best analogy I can think of. So we try to write one prompt for each exercise type, but we can swap out information based on a specific use case. So for example, if I'm working on the Spanish course, I would want to fill in Spanish for this blank. If I'm working on B2 content, I would want to change this A2 into B2. Uh, if I was targeting a different word, I can change this. And if I'm targeting a different grammatical concept, I can change this. So that way we're able to write a single prompt that is useful for many different courses at many different language learning levels, focusing on many different concepts. So variables is one way we're using prompt engineering to really get the output we want. Another is rules. Uh, like I said, when we were looking at the I really like French fries example, the more intricate our input is, the more nuanced our output is. So when I write really detailed rules, you need to do this, this, and this, it steers the model toward what we want. And we try to be very clear with these rules. Now, sometimes the rules don't get followed in the way that we uh, intended. And that's why we also include examples. Just like when I said, write the tale of two cities, but in Gen Z slang, the tale of two cities text is like an anchoring piece for the prompt. It, is something that the model can latch onto and try to reproduce. So for example, I have this example here. And by seeing a good model of good behavior, the model is then able to reproduce it more faithfully. Sometimes we add good examples. Sometimes we add incorrect examples um, just to try to steer it away from something as well. I have variables. I have rules. I have examples. 
Another big piece is formatting. I said GPT is really good at formatting, or AI models are really good at formatting. By having a very concrete formatting structure, we're able to get exactly what we want. Without this last piece, sometimes the model will follow the rules more or less, but it'll write it in a way that we didn't expect. So by having a really tight formatting schema, we are able to get exactly what we want, and it's able to integrate into our internal tools much better. And then this formatting seems a little odd because I have these very, very long labels. But actually, the labels are able to push us in the right direction as well. You can see I reiterate some of my rules in the labels. So for example, one of the rules is this exercise must be fewer than 75 characters. I say question 75 characters max as my label. By reiterating that and by making the model type that out when it gives its answer, it's more likely to follow that rule. So these are all strategies that we have learned explicitly from prompt engineering training. And it's also strategies that we've figured out as we've continued to work with AI. So like I said, this particular prompt is not an actual prompt that we're using. I put it on the slide for demonstration purposes. This is an image of one of our actual prompts. I know it's hard to see. We're not actually going to read it. Um, but this is just to demonstrate how intricate some of these prompts are because there are a lot of rules that govern what make an exercise good or an exercise bad. You can also see these two lines here. You can expand these boxes. So actually there's much more text than, um, than is shown on the screen right now. So one major part of our prompts are the input variables here. These are like the Mad Libs, the blanks. And so I can control for the language level based on the CEFR. I can control for the language. I can add a lesson context to make the exercise fit with a certain theme. I can add notes for specific instructions that I want for the exercise. I can focus on a different target word. There are lots of things that I can control for in this prompt. The next pieces of text are all those instructions, rules, examples, and formatting pieces. And then the last part, you see these three blue check marks. These are the only three parts where the AI model fills in the text. So the generation doesn't come until the very end. We've got to really prime the model with a really intricate input to steer our output toward what we want. And I say steer because we'll only ever really get close. We never, we never hit the mark fully. There are some exercises that uh, exit the AI model and they're perfect. And some of them need to be tweaked and some of them kind of miss the mark. So to talk a little bit about how that process works, um, First, I want to show what it's like to use the prompt. So I've added this video. Um, let me go back actually, so I can illustrate this better. Um, I'm able to open in my, um, in my course, this is a Duolingo internal tool, this generation button. So I want to generate a gap fill item. Like I said, we try to have one prompt for each exercise type, but sometimes we have to diverge. There are special cases where we might want to a specific prompt for a more specific question. So I choose my prompt. I choose one exercise. I can make up to 10 at a time. And I've chosen the target word that I want, silverware. And when I click this blue generate button, the model thinks it inputs all the data that I want. And then after 33.4 seconds, I sped up the video, I get this item. And this item actually is pretty good for uh, what I, the use case that I want here. And I would say 33 seconds is much faster than it would take uh, an actual person to write an exercise like this. And so we're able to create lots and lots of items in a huge scale very quickly with these generative AI prompts. Now, like I said, let me get to the next slide. Excuse me. Like I said, the items when they come out are not necessarily perfect. A lot of them need to be tweaked. So we've created this pipeline that allows content creators to be using these tools while also informing prompt engineers for how to make the tools better. So we have developed a small team of prompt engineers at Duolingo who are really writing these prompts to create the exercises that we want. So their job is to write a prompt that gets us as close as possible to 100% usable items. They then hand those tools off to content creators who are making these items in bulk. So when an hour you used to be able to make maybe 20 exercises, now we're making 100 exercises an hour. Now, all of these exercises aren't necessarily ready to go in the app. 
So the content creators are deleting the items that are not meeting our standards. They're tweaking some of the items that are almost there, and they're keeping some items as well. At this point, we have about 50% of our items being created by generative AI. We'd like to make that number go up to about 80. Um, but currently, half of the items are still being written by people, and half are being written by generative AI. Those items, once they're finished, go to course owners. And they are graded based on the same rubric we would have for any other piece of content. In fact, these course owners often don't know which items, which items have been generated and which items uh, were created by people. Everything still has to pass the Duolingo quality bar. Now, like I said, some of these items are problematic or they're not perfect. And so content creators are making note of what improvements we could have in the prompt to make more items usable from the get-go. And based on that information, prompt engineers take some of that feedback and they say, OK, we need to fix the prompt so that it does this. Everybody has feedback that this doesn't work, so we're going to change it. So we are constantly updating, editing, tweaking, even branching off some of our prompts to make sure that they are creating quality content for our courses. Some of those pieces, though, can't necessarily be fixed by prompt engineering. We could maybe fix one aspect of the output, but that would hurt another aspect of the output. So instead of uh, trying to opt for one thing over another, we realized that some of the improvements we could have are a training piece. So based on some of the feedback, we create training materials and webinars and videos and workshops for our content creators to become better tool users, to be, become better at using the generative AI tools that we've built. And based on those two actions, we're able to generate even more items in bulk, luckily, or that are at better quality. We started, I think, at uh, maybe 10% creation a year ago, and now we're up to 50, which is great. Um, reasons, I'm sorry, I'm not monitoring the chat very actively, but I just saw a question. What are the reasons um, we might dismiss an item? Um, sometimes we have very technical restraints. So uh, an item might be too long, too many characters. We're really restricted by like screen size, I think. Um, so when items are too long, they often need to be abbreviated or they need to be deleted. Sometimes we've noticed that um, a very particular grammar concept is what we are targeting in the item. And the AI will use that grammar concept and it'll use the word, but in the wrong form. So we can get it very close to including all the pieces that we need, but like one piece will be off. Sometimes that's as easy as, you know, changing from first person singular to third person plural. Um, and we just, you know, switch the subject of the sentence. But other times it's really kind of tried as hard as it can to fulfill all our requirements, but one of them is just not fixable. Luckily, we're able to make so many items in a short amount of time that it's not a sad experience to delete them. Um, in fact, we're doing it all the time. So this is how we've been using generative AI to create more items uh, in bulk at a fast rate. We're also using generative AI to create immersive features. And this is through the Duolingo Max subscription, which is the highest tier subscription that is available in Spanish and French in a select number of countries. We really are excited to expand this and scale it out to more countries and more languages. But right now, it's definitely a work in process as we you know, figure out how best to use these AI tools to serve our learners. So like I said, when I joined Duolingo, I was working on monolingual exercises. And these monolingual exercises had only the target language. And the goal was to simulate immersion. But it's hard to simulate immersion on a mobile app. It's hard to do it when the question is only a couple seconds long. But we've finally been able to do that thanks to generative AI through a feature called role play. Now, role play truly does simulate immersion as best as we can. Now, I think some people might be thinking, well, you know, I'm trying to learn Spanish. Why can't I just go on ChatGPT and say, help me practice Spanish and then have a conversation? Our experience is very curated for learning value, for entertainment value, for bite-sizedness, and for an overall Duolingo themed experience. So for one, everything is driven by a learning objective. We have two different types. We have transactional learning objectives, which are like order food and drink or buy and sell items or, you know, like take transportation. And then we have more interpersonal learning objectives, which are like talk about your childhood or describe your day or tell me the members of your family, things like that. And each one of these role plays has a singular learning objective that we want learners to be able to complete. 
We also have branded this like Duolingo. This is not a generic chatbot that you're talking to, but instead in our prompt, we've injected Duolingo character personalities and speaking styles and facts. So if you're doing Duolingo stories and you've been introduced to these characters before, it's trying to simulate having a conversation with that character that you might already know. And finally, we have scaffolding for diverse CIFR levels. It's really intimidating for beginner learners to have to try to produce free form production in their target language. And so we've added a lot of supports so that they can simulate a conversation that might not be totally doable in the real world, but we'll give them the tools to build up to that within our app. So role play has a couple of distinct features. First of all, we have scaffolding support for early learners. We have this translate button that is available if you need it. We also have this scaffolding here, which now is tappable. So if I am not able to type a response at my learning level, I can tap out a response. Um, additionally, we have narrative features like plot twists and plot development. We have narration throughout. And this kind of keeps the learner on their toes. It doesn't necessarily feel like uh, the normal language learning classroom where you're uh, asked to create a role play. Instead, we kind of throw you a few curveballs to make it more entertaining. Most of the time, these plot twists are actually in the learner's native language. So it, it doesn't really uh, require a whole lot of language learning uh, or language expertise to be able to enjoy these Plot twists, rather, it's it's just a narrative feature that makes the experience more fun. And then finally, we give feedback on your um, on the learner responses. So, for example, this says, uh, you know, great, this was a successful answer with correct grammar. And then, in small mistakes, we give feedback based on performance of the learner. I saw a question: Is there an option to turn off hints? There absolutely is. Let me see if I see here this arrow right here. If you touch this, it will hide things for you. So they're there if you need it, but not necessary. Um, and it is a truly dynamic experience. So you're not at all beholden to write what's on the hints. It's really just to give you a jump start if you need an extra push. And so the way role play is working with generative AI is actually quite interesting. Apart from the learner response, which you as the learner would be typing yourself, Every single element of a role play is a separate prompt. So you could see these two speech bubbles spoken by Oscar as two separate prompts. So you almost might think of this as like character response A and character response B. And then we have this very intricate flow chart that shows which states can go to which. Um, I've tried to illustrate this. This is a little like spaghetti with wires getting crossed. It's okay if uh, it seems confusing, it's confusing to me. And this is just an example of it. It's not the real flow chart. So we'll always start a role play with a narration. There's a prompt that shows what the narration should be. Then the character will say something. This character response is injected with character speaking style. It's injected with you know character background and biography. It's also injected with the first narration. We need to have the character know what the scene is, what the context is, what the learning objective is to try to steer the learner toward an adequate response. The learner will respond to character A, and then from there, all kinds of things can happen. The learner can have the same type of response, the learner can have a different type of response, the learner can have a new narration, and this will bounce back and forth among all these different states and all these different prompts until finally we get to a conclusion. So all of these blue boxes are separate prompts, and it's actually more intricate than this, but in this example, I have five separate prompts that are fueling the role play experience. Now, you can imagine these like as a set. Now, here I have like my default set of prompts, but if I am an A1 learner, I might actually need more nuanced prompts that make sure that the language I'm seeing is doable for my language level. So we then have, a different set of prompts for A1 learners. They're mostly the same, but they contain some language about what structures are allowed to be used, what kinds of vocabulary are allowed to be used, things like that. So we've uh, adapted our prompt set um, to better support A1 learners. We also are in the process of adapting our prompts to better serve interpersonal contexts. Right now, a lot of our role plays are transactional and they have a very rich scene and scenario laid out, and there is a goal for the learner to achieve by the end. But we also want to create more interpersonal dialogues as well, where learners can just talk about themselves. 
And that requires a little bit of a different type of prompting for the world character, because we're really pushing the world character to ask about the learner, for the learner to kind of drive the conversation and share information that's genuine about themselves. So we have a different prompt set for those. Now, this is not yet being worked on, but I could see in the future having specific prompt sets for different languages. Um, some concepts are easier in some languages than they are in others. And we could say, hey, in French at the A1 level, you can use these structures. In Spanish at the A1 level, you can use these structures. So each of these prompts kind of branches out into different versions to best support the learner in this, uh, the type of content that they're trying to consume, the level that they're at, and maybe even one day the language that they're trying to focus on. So each of these prompts is all kind of working together in an ecosystem. So that's our role play experience. Another way we are leveraging generative AI to create a better learning experience for our users is through Max Coach. And Max Coach is kind of what it sounds like. It's part of the Max subscription tier, and it's almost framing Duo the Owl as a coach for language learning. There are two basic ways that you can use this feature. The first is called on-call tips, and it's before you submit an answer. So let's say you get a question, and it seems like too tricky for you. You don't even know where to start. This I'm going to get it wrong. Or you might be in a situation where you're pretty sure you're going to get it right, but you just want that extra confirmation before you hit submit. So before you answer a question, you can click Duo the Coach at the bottom, and it'll give you a hint on how you might be able to respond to the question. And we're using generative AI feeding in the question so far, and we're trying to determine the concepts most likely to be difficult for a learner and feeding them a response. The other functionality is called explain my answer, and it's here. And this you would click after you've submitted a response. And this will explain why your answer was incorrect, or you could also click it to explain why your answer is correct. So both of these are using Duo the Owl as a coach to give you language tips or language explanations. And these are dynamically generated, meaning it's specific for the exercise that you're working on, but we still take a Duolingo approach and style to these grammar explanations. And what I mean by that is these are based on tips that you can see within the Duolingo app. So these are tips that you can get before using a lesson. And we really try to adhere to the Duolingo method, which we use for all of our apps and their learning content. So the language app, the literacy app, the math app, and I'm excited to say that coming soon, we have a music app. We, in all of these apps, we try to avoid jargon and technical speech, and we try to explain in as much layman terms as possible. So you can see in this example, we don't actually use the word singular or plural, even though that's what we're explaining. In this example, we don't use the word nasal at all. And I'm actually kind of surprised that we use the word vowel, but we do use vowel. And so these tips in the Max Coach ecosystem are using the same style, and they've been fed with these types of tips to try to make sure that the Duolingo brand and teaching style and method is respected while using this feature. So those are our main ways we're using generative AI at Duolingo. We are generating content uh, to create the questions that you see in the app. We're simulating immersion by using our role play feature, and we are having on-call tips and explain my answer through Max Coach, where we get really targeted grammar instruction in usable language for users. Now, in the future, uh, we see expanding these types of initiatives. We even have an experimental AI team, which are trying to you know, think of brand new ways to use AI in our features. We also have a team called Media Learning, and they are going to be putting out a lot of new content soon that uh, will target listening practice. I'm really excited about that. And those are all dynamically generated with GPT. Um, but within the features that I just showed to you, I can think of a couple future iterations that I'd like to see. So when generating content, we are excited to try to generate more in bulk to create diverse outputs. So currently, I can say produce three items, but I get input, output. Input, output, input, output. My input is always the same because I'm targeting this word, I'm targeting this grammar. I'm in this course at this language level. And so often our output looks really, really similar. Every time we generate, we might get some diversity, but for the most part, the item looks the same. And if the item has some problems, that's not an experience that we want. So we're working with engineers to be able to generate in bulk 
So instead of input, output, input, output, it will be input, output, output, output. And each of those outputs we're hoping has a different flavor, takes a different approach, and teaches the concept in a different way so that we can choose the best one out of those. Also, since we're able to create so much content in bulk, we're trying to introduce a swipe mechanic, which is kind of like Tinder for Duolingo exercises. So imagine you're a content creator, you've just produced 100 exercises with one click, and now you need to figure out which ones are usable, which ones are tweakable, and which ones need to be thrown out. Like Tinder, I can swipe left if I want to delete it, I can swipe right if I can tweak it into something usable, and I can swipe up if I want to just keep it and put it in the app. So we're excited to be able to move through content more quickly with this mechanic as well. In Max Coach, I'm excited to say that in a couple weeks, if not, then a couple months, we will be having bite-sized role play at the end of learning lessons. So imagine you're doing a Duolingo lesson, you finish, and you get a question like this. This question is based on the learning objective of the lesson and the new words that you've been practicing in the lesson. So if you're doing a lesson about uh, food and drink and the new words are about breakfast foods and breakfast drinks, you might get a question like this, which feels really aligned to the content you're already experiencing in the app. And you can write a dynamic answer and get uh, feedback on exactly how you've done based on that question. So rather than a back and forth exchange like a regular role play, this is just a one and done, allows you almost like a capstone to showcase what you learned in the lesson. And then in terms of tapped hints, um, for in terms of the Max Coach, we are introducing tapped hints. So like I said, if you get a question that seems very difficult and you click the coach button, Duo will give you an exam or an explanation for how to solve how to solve the question or how to answer the question. We are assuming what we think the learner finds difficult, but we can't be sure what concept the learner finds most difficult. So instead, we've chunked out the words in an exercise, and the learner can tap each chunk of words to really focus on what is giving them trouble. You can tap on all of them to see what each word in the sentence is doing, and you can get more information about how the language is functioning. So I think those have actually already been launched. So if you're using Duolingo Max, you might see them in the app as of today. So these are future iterations that I'm really excited about in our content generation uh, work stream, in our role play product, and in our Max Coach product. And I can see lots of different ways to use generative AI for language learning, and especially in the Duolingo app. Um, I'm excited that I got to talk about a lot of these features with you today. I want to thank everyone for having me, for paying attention. Um, I would love to answer some questions. I know some have been coming up in the chat. And like I said, I've been kind of looking at the screen more so than the chat. Um, I also welcome you to come off mute if you have any questions. Um, and I'm happy to answer. Parker, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation of yours. Uh, I must say, I always uh, opt for the old fashioned way of clapping hands even in front of the screen. That's what I'm going to do now, hoping that many of us will join. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, there have been, you mentioned this, there have been several questions in the chat. Uh, perhaps we can just read some of them or ask those who ask these questions to perhaps uh, make them even more uh, precise. Um, my chat is jumping around a little bit because I guess there are so many, many so much praise for you. Um, so um, actually, Phrase is wonderful, but it makes the chat jump. Or oh, perhaps is there anyone who would like to answer to ask a question overly first? I uh, first then, of all, uh, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, please. Um, first, that was a great Go presentation. Ahead, um, I, you know, I just started working in tech. I'm an ex-academic, ex-language and linguistics professor. Um, and so generative AI, of course, is the newest, hottest thing. Um, and I don't know all that much about it. And this was super informative. So I appreciate that. Um, my question was going to be if <laughs> the presentation or at least a video of it is going to be available so that I can watch it again. It, it, will. it will not so extremely soon, but it will. OK, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm seeing so, one in the chat. Uh, um, uh, is you, is yeah, there a question in the chat? 
uh, is there a course you would suggest for language educators transitioning into prompt engineering? I can say the best <laughs> resource that I have found that teaches prompt engineering in a really accessible way, I'm going to put in the chat right now. Um, it's a website, totally free. Um, and I read through it when I started prompt engineering, and it really puts things out into uh, like very understandable terms. It's not overly technical, and it uh, helped me overcome a lot of barriers. So I'd encourage you all to check that out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gabriel, I think you have a question as well, if I uh, interpret your virtual hand correctly. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm from New York, and a uh, Duolingo user since 2015 or 2014. Nice. I I enjoyed your presentation a lot. I have a question. Since you are using generative AI, are you thinking about introducing new features to the path? Like I know, like in a few years ago, you introduced the stories, mm -hmm. and it would be a good idea to introduce other features like readings or something like that. Is that something that the Duolingo is planning? To yes, I I can't go super into detail, but I can tell you that the I understand. The path right now um, needs more immersive features. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, both senior leadership, learning leadership, and users uh, really want to see more immersive features in the app. We'll always have the basic lessons where you're able to have targeted practice, but we're really um, we're hoping in each unit to have at least like three immersive features at some point. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Uh, Magda, you have asked two questions at least in the chat. Would you like to ask one of them, or perhaps even both, um, overly? Because one of them is very long, so it might be better. Sure, you thank you. No, I was just wondering about your thoughts on, on leveling. I think when I'm trying to create um, activities for my students, what I struggle yes. with the most, or what I think um, ChatGPT, for example, struggles with is creating outputs at the level that I'm requesting. Um, and I think other teachers that I've talked to um, experience that problem as well. So like, how do you deal with that? Is that yeah. your human experts that address that or? Um, we can prompt to get closer, but uh, that is definitely an issue. We're getting um, a lot of structures and words that are too advanced, more so than too simple. Um, a couple of things that we found that work is um, one, uh, creating like a role for the model. So saying like, you are a teacher of absolute beginners who only know these words. Create an exercise that targets X, Y, and Z. I've also found it's really useful to have the model just describe the CIFR level before it even starts working. So I'll say like step one, describe what an A1 CIFR level uh, learner can do. And I say like max 50 words. And then it will uh, output a description of A1 CIFR level. And it tends to be more targeted when when it's kind of primed itself in that way. So that, that might be a suggestion as well. There is no one catch-all strategy. I, I know it's very frustrating because um, as humans, it's really easy for us to scan a text and know if it's appropriate or not, but it, for the model, it's quite hard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say congratulations to one of our um, attendees, Rakshad, I think, or Rakhat, sorry for that, uh, who just mentioned he has a 1,000 plus day streak wow. on Duolingo. So congratulations on that. Uh, actually, I think that we might be around 10 or even more uh, active Duolingo users. If you all come out <laughs> to let mm -hmm. us know, it will even be more exact, but that's actually the best which can happen, that we all talk not only from theory, but also uh, in terms of the practice we have gained with you, Lingo. Uh, Pablo, mm -hmm. may I ask you to go on, please? Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Barry. Hi, Henry. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, I'm an um, AI trainer and an uh, English trainer and a business trainer. So I am creating an um, AI course for teachers that i be delivering this Friday. This was very interesting. My, my wife is a fan of yours for the German. Uh, she always gets in the first position and uh, nice. she, she never misses a day. So I think the gamification that you have going on, it's absolutely bonkers. So congrats again on that. I have a question regarding um, pronunciation. Mm -hmm. so I know that the model could be trained on how to um, help you with pronunci 
pronunciation. I don't know if you've tried this and how accurate it is. Um, yeah, so actually we envisioned role play uh, originally as a speaking feature rather than a typing feature. Uh -huh. um, the issue that we've run into is that Duolingo's automatic speech recognition software or ASR, uh, it, it's owned by us and it's not owned by any, we don't license from another company. And it's not quite at the point to pick up non-native uh, speakers super accurately. Right. So I would love, we have uh, an entire team dedicated to pronunciation and speaking. Um, I'd love for them to kind of get more on board with, uh, with our AI initiatives, but I think we need to upgrade our technology for recognizing speech better before we get onto that. Okay. All right, thanks everyone. Look, sorry, would you like to ask a question? Uh, sorry, you're the one with this wonderful 1000 plus day streak. Yes. Um, so would you like to ask a question? Uh, not really. I don't have a question. I just want uh, to I congratulate congratulate oh, okay. uh, Duolingo in terms of uh, updating and uh, enriching the experience all the time. And mm -hmm. I just want to highlight that uh, as a learner, I prefer Duolingo as a useful practice tool for me to combine it with mm -hmm. actual teaching in a classroom with a teacher and with a group because I'm a social learner of language. Whereas as opposed to me, my husband is actually uh, has 1,435 yeah. streaks with a week uh, 153 on Diamond League Dang. and learning German via English. Unlike me, he likes learning alone and he started speaking already German with the help of Duolingo. That's great to hear. Do, do you really, uh, Duolingo really seems to be a kind of a family matter in some cases. That's wonderful. Uh, may, may I just uh, refer to one question in the chat, which we have overlooked so far? Jackie Robbins asked, what are the most common reasons that the content creators reject items for? Uh, yeah, I think I glossed over that. But um, I, I said, one, we have technical restraints. So if uh, an item is too long, um, that, that will reject an item. Another, um, actually, it goes in line with the question I just answered. Sometimes it uses words that are just uh, too advanced. Sometimes that's tweakable. We can swap for another word. But other times, it, you know, it's just littered with uh, language that is too advanced for the learner. And then um, sometimes it'll try to follow the rules as best as possible. So for example, it'll, you know, it'll use the past tense when we asked it to. It'll use the verb that we're targeting but it'll have two clauses and one clause is in the past tense, the other clause uses the verb that we want in the present tense. So uh, we we sometimes see it follow the rules, but be kind of sneaky and that'll cause us to delete an item. Okay, thank you very much. So that's quite enlightening. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, please. Chris Fry, your hand is up. Um, this might just be by accident or not. I, I see his question in the chat. It says, will immersive features okay. be available on the free tier one day? I, I think that's a really good yeah, question. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Duolingo really prides itself on uh, not blocking learning content. And that's kind of what it feels like by uh, developing this and putting it behind a paywall. One day, yes, we would like to have this uh, for free. The limitation is that um, using AI is expensive. When we have uh, lots and lots of users, uh, tapping into our like AI account every day, we pay for uh, that use of technology. As AI becomes cheaper, and as we figure out ways to um, lessen the cost of our own usage, um, and as we create the feature to a point where we feel really proud of it, like it would really benefit a lot of people, then I think we'll expand to the free version. Right now, it's really much uh, a work in progress. It's, it's available to the public, but it's something that we are still very much iterating on. Okay, thank you very much. So are there any very urgent questions to be asked because we have to watch time a little bit? Uh, yes, please. Sorry for the pronunciation. I think you have a question as well, unless it's in the chat. Would you like to quickly ask it? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you're a little bit low, but if you speak very loud, we will be able to. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, Greetings, I'm from Indonesia. My name is Narendra Sawati, and um, I graduated from English linguistics, and I have a very strong desire and I have a strong interest in computational linguistics, and I just want to ask um, you about uh, how this field will 
this field will uh, thriving in the future? Is there any place for uh, linguistic students to be what is like? Uh, is, is there any um, opportunity in the future, for example, for uh, linguistic students to work in a tech company and using our knowledge in the field of linguistics uh, and work with the AI thing in the tech industry? Maybe mm. that's what I want to ask. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that generative AI and prompting is going to become a skill that a lot of folks are looking for in all kinds of industries. So I'd say if you can brush up on that and build that skill independently, it'll make you more competitive. Um, one thing that, you know, people ask me about jobs a lot. And the thing I say is apply to everything, apply to things that you're not qualified for, because if anything, it'll give you good experience in like how to navigate that process. Um, I, in terms of AI, I think, um, yeah, the, the more you can showcase that skill and the more you can um, speak with authority on it when um, seeking out opportunities that I, I could only see it's beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe may I ask you if you have uh, some questions or some remarks on the basis of your experience? <laughs> um, I'm um, a bit out of the loop on this one, as people who know me will recognize, but I'm interested in a question that hasn't been dealt with by Wasi Rizvi, who I think is in Pakistan. Can Duolingo help IT professionals from countries like Pakistan to remove the barrier of the English language while browsing? So I'm browsing in English, I don't understand what I'm reading. Can you help? Yeah, that's a really good question. So every year we have what's called a hackathon at Duolingo, and it's where all employees drop everything they're doing. And for three days, you work on any project that is inspiring to you that has something to do with Duolingo. And we actually developed this year a web browser um, connection that allows for translation um, and even with a Duolingo touch on your browser. Now, that's not a project that we've hooked up full time, but it's a question that we're thinking about a lot. And in terms of um, you know, access and um, English language proficiency, I think um, keeping the app free is a great way to try to encourage folks to uh, you know, keep up practice regardless of um, situation or context. And then um, additionally, you know, I, I'm not involved with this super heavily, but we have the Duolingo English test, which is an English certification that we've tried to make as accessible as possible to people all around the world. It's much cheaper than its alternatives. You can take it at home and it's uh, much less time. So we are constantly thinking about how to um, kind of disrupt the, the language learning world and try to make it more equitable um, in a lot of ways. But I, I thank you for the question. I think it's something that we should be thinking about. Interesting, good, thank you. Um, we are um, pretty much out of time, Thomas. So I think maybe we should- but there's lots more to be asked, I have to tell you. <laughs> there's one yes. uh, question by Janara, which I find very mm -hmm. important as well. What about losing motivation? So when Duolingo users, duos, lose mm -hmm. motivation, what can they do? What can Duolingo do to increase mm -hmm. their motivation uh, once it go it's going down? Yeah, so one of the biggest metrics that we're looking at at Duolingo is what's called a uh, CUR, or Current User Retention Rate. Um, and that means injecting a lot of no motivating features into the app. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks have seen that it's a very gamified experience. We try to use the streak mechanic, the leagues mechanic. We try to make it so that you can learn languages with your friends. And so we have entire, not even a team, it's a whole area that's dedicated to trying to keep and retain users. There's also some really good um, blog post articles by Dr. Cindy Blanco, who was mentioned at the beginning. And she's written at, at length about staying motivated on Duolingo. So I encourage you to Look at the Duolingo blog as well for inspiration. Thank you very much. So I've started sharing the screen already, which is a little bit suggestive then, because as Barry said, we do have to watch time. and So uh, let me thank you. Let us, Barry, uh, Barry and I, let us thank you again very much for this wonderful presentation. So there are some internal things we might want to uh, hint at. Barry, would you like to uh, talk about uh, the ICC Journal, which you're the editor of. Very, very, very um, quickly. We, basically, it's um, an academic journal. It's online. It's free of charge. And basically, if you would like a copy, all you have to do is email ICC Journal, and uh, we'll get you on the list. 
we send you a personal copy, and when we upload, you can get it obviously on the web. Very informative articles from my members. We have uh, teaching tips. We have a summary of um, some of the key, um, uh, like this one, um, of the key presentations on the webinars, and uh, also news about Uralta, which is <laughs> the um, language teaching uh, courses, teacher training courses for people who are actually in a room or online or, or other operation and something I think we could discuss in the future. So ICC Journal, if you're interested, let us know. We'll put you on the list and we'll send you personal copies and we'll also invite you to write for it as well and share your own ideas and experience. That's it. ICC Thank you very Journal. much, Barry. And Yes, please go ahead. No, no. They, um, well, ba basically, ICC membership has been around for a long, long time. It's great value to people in the um, in 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 Europe, but also around the world. And we have so mm -hmm. many members from around the world. Is really mm -hmm. three things. Number one, it brings teachers of different languages together. Number two, it is excellent as a way in looking at teacher training. And thirdly, most importantly, probably, it's Uralta program, the European mm -hmm. teaching, um, uh, language teaching uh, course and certification is very, very important in helping teachers get work. Mm -hmm. So and those please... are the three things I would say are very important. You may want to add something. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And please uh, put this uh, imperative join us into practice that would be very nice for us for us thank you very much mary uh, so uh, let's just uh, round off this webinar by parker henry today uh, we would like to thank you again for this wonderful presentation uh, which has given us so much insight in the combination of language learning and ai and i think those us who are duos um, will definitely think of ai uh, in a different way and also of duolingo in a different way uh, than beforehand when using it. So in the vein of uh, this Duolingo spirit, let us then take this as a motivation to learn even more languages uh, than we may have learned up to the present day. Uh, let us uh, allow languages to connect us for meeting new people and getting to know new cultures. And above all, uh, continue loving languages and language learning and also language teaching. So finally, Barry and I would like to thank each and every one of you for participating in this webinar. Best of luck to all of you for your language journey and your intercultural and interlingual adventures. Thank you very much for today and see you next time. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.